in the context of that, I had a, a great sermon planned for you today. I was going to wrap up our, our Modern Family Vintage Values series, and it just didn't feel right. Um, even though it was a, a fantastic sermon, you'll have to trust me on that one. Um, but it, it, was, it was the big closer, and uh, it just didn't feel the right direction to go. So, so as of last night, I switched, which is great. God leads, the Holy Spirit provides. Uh, but it does mean that I'm probably not as polished today as I might normally be or, or would like to be. Uh, but that's okay, because God is good and I trust God in it. And, and as I was thinking about this week and as uh, things have been going on, and, um, and, and, and one thing I should mention that I failed to mention, Pastor Glenn Browning will be presiding on the funeral on Friday and, and give him praise and thanks for that as well. Um, we do appreciate his, his love. It will be here at church. But uh, as I was thinking about the different things in life and just how life comes and what goes on, I, I returned to a story uh, that I experienced in my life. And this was my junior year of high school, right actually at the beginning of my junior year of high school. And I used to drive, you need to know, a 1975 Chevy Impala, a four-door Impala. It was burnt orange. Uh, eventually, by the time I got rid of this car, uh, it was more rust than orange, but because of the color of the car, you couldn't tell the difference, so it didn't look as shabby or as unreliable as it actually was. And I drove that car for many, many years. It was my great-grandmother's car for many, many years, and then um, as she reached her 90s, she felt that it was too big of a car for her to be driving, which we agreed, and so she sold it to my family, and she bought herself a Ford Taurus, and she continued driving till she was 93. Um, and so I, I ended up with this lightly used... Uh, you know, car, if you've never been in a 75 Impala, it's the same length as a Chevy Suburban without the storage in the back. And I mean that literally. When you park next to a Suburban, bumper to bumper, the same length. Um, so you, you get all the size without all of the convenience. Um, same motors as the bigger trucks, but without the frame. And what they did then, uh, Impala is supposed to be kind of a comfort ride. And so it was like, you know, a waterbed. Kind of. You know, you just floated. You, the, the road was there visually, but you really didn't feel it for the most part. And, and it, was, it was a great car to drive because I, I could throw five, six of my offensive linemen for my football team in the back and there was still room for more. It, it was just a great high school car. And uh, one day I was driving and I'm, I'm driving down the road and I'm not too far from my parents' home uh, heading back to their place. And, and all of a sudden I just hear the loudest bang. And simultaneously, the car just about breaks my arm and steers me to the left into the path of an oncoming cement truck. And yes, frightening. Um, so immediately, of course, I grabbed the steering wheel, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a small guy, and I wasn't a small guy in high school either. And, and I'm pulling with all of my might, trying to turn this wheel to get me back over to the right first. So the Stunt truck doesn't run me over, but also just so I can safely bring this car to a stop. Um, my brain is only thinking of steering. I couldn't even think about stopping with the brake at this point because I, I literally had to brace my foot against the wheel well. I remember uh, I turned the high beams on because it was one of those old cars with the high beams on the floor, right? I turned the high beams on while I'm cranking on this wheel trying to keep it out of oncoming traffic. I eventually get it over to the curb, kind of rub the curb, hit the curb, bring it to a stop, just dead sweats, scared to death, no idea what happened, get out and look, and, and the front driver's tire is just about gone, just destroyed. The rim is destroyed, the tire is destroyed. I, I walked back down the road a little ways, and it had been lightly raining that day, and there was a pothole, um, and you couldn't really tell the severity of this pothole because the rain had filled it in. You know, the rain makes it look nice and level. And so you think you're going to hit a pothole and just roll over it. Apparently, this was the pothole of all potholes. It was a tire eater, and, and it destroyed the tire and rim and everything else in this car. And thankfully, I, I'm alive today. But it was unexpected, and I didn't know it was going to happen, and it just came out of the blue. And I was driving along and going along my own, my own business, and life was good, and bam, it happened. And sometimes life is like that, right? Um, we have huge potholes occasionally in our lives. Um, and we can relate that to so many things in our experience of life. And, and one of the places we can relate to that is, is in our own faith experience. That, 
You know, I remember back when I first decided to follow Jesus. I, I came to faith when I was 19 in college, and uh, it was a great thing and a wonderful thing, but I, I didn't exactly know how it was all going to work, but I kind of had this false notion that now that I'm following Jesus, everything's going to be good, right? Wrong. Uh, that isn't what my experience was. I, I, I kind of thought, well, things will get better. You know, real quickly. And, and some things certainly did, but not everything necessarily fell into place. And instead, in fact, some things started falling out of place. I had to get out of some relationships that I was in that weren't good relationships and all kinds of other stuff, and complexity came with that. And, and, and sometimes it just seems that as soon as things are going well, then bam, something bad happens, and, and like we hit that pothole, and it derails our life. Now, in the Gospel of John, in John 16, Jesus is about to be crucified. And in that time, Jesus speaks in that passage of John 16.33, if you'd like to follow along. Um, John 16.33, Jesus speaks about two things in this passage. And these two things are both true. And you'll see it on the screen here as well. It says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, did you see that there? That is a, a take possession of. Not, that's not a hope for peace or a, a wish for peace. But that's a, a have peace. And Jesus tells us where we can have that peace. In Him, we can have that peace. Some might wonder, what is the peace that, uh, that Jesus is talking about? And the peace that he is talking about is only found in a relationship with him. You see, in this world, there's, there's two spiritual realities. There's a, there's a spiritual kingdom, one that has no end, one that's perfect, and, and one that is beautiful. But then there is this present that we experience, this present reality, this world that we live in, a, a broken down, falling apart, corrupted by sin, filled with chaos world. And, and Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Now some of us understand trouble, right? I mean, we, we, we've experienced trouble. Some of us, big, big time trouble. I mean, I'm not talking about the I've lost my keys kind of trouble, but huge faith-shaking trouble. The kind of trouble that, that rocks us down to the core, that, that makes us think at times, God, where are you? Are you there? That big Mount Everest size trouble that comes and it feels like it's going to crush us and snuff us out. Now, you may not be experiencing that this morning or even this week, but... For every one of us, if you haven't experienced it, my life experience tells me it's probably coming for you at some point. And that is why it's so important for us to know why it is good news where we know where our hope comes from, where our peace comes from. We live in these overlapping realities. One, as Jesus said, is called trouble. The other one is way above it is an overcoming Savior. And yet they are both true at the same time, coinciding here in the same span of time. And if we separate those two realities out, if we try to live in just one or the other, we end up with very bad theologies. If, if, if we just believe simply that life is hard, get used to it, right? Roll with it. That's just the way it is, and you can't do anything about it. That's not a good spiritual viewpoint. And it certainly doesn't sound overcoming in any sort of way. The flip side of that is an oversimplification of the idea that God is for us. Yes, God is for us. I love that Bible verse. But there's an oversimplification that says, well, I'm a Christian, and if God is for me, everything is going to be smooth sailing from here on for me. And I'm not going to accept that there might be any hardships. There's nothing, nothing bad can happen, right? Right? Now, both of these views, individually, are terrible theologies because they don't work. But if you bring the two of them together and realize that, you know, in this time and in this world, they overlap. If you put them together, you begin to enter into what Jesus is talking about. 
And it is this. Trouble comes. Life hurts. But God is bigger. And God is always at work. Christians are not exempt from difficulty. We are going to have the same hardships that the rest of the world is going to have. But we have the confidence in Jesus who said in it, through all of it, no matter what happens, I am the overcoming Savior. And there is hope in that. We may not know when, but there is hope. We don't know when the trouble is going to come. But in Jesus, there is hope. In it all, through it all, whatever happens, Jesus is our overcoming Savior. And when it comes, this is the question we must ask. Where are we going to turn to? Our life might be great right now, but in a day, a week, a month, an hour, a moment, maybe next month, when the bottom drops out, when you hit that pothole unexpectedly, where will you turn to? What do we do when the bottom drops out of life? The good news is, the great news is, we have somewhere to turn. There is somewhere for us to turn when life hurts, and it's to the cross of Jesus. That's where we go when we hit the potholes. That's where we go when we hit the bottom. That's where we go when the bottom falls out. But some might say, hey, Don, hey, hey, hold on a second there, Pastor. Or, Wait a minute. You know, you're talking about the cross here. And that, that's in the past, right? And, and the cross, it's just about salvation and having our sins forgiven, isn't it? No. Yes, it is that. But it is so much more. The cross is the centerpiece. The cross is the core. And the cross isn't something that, that we just once upon a time come and do some business with God and then move on with our lives. The cross is everything. Scripture tells us, Hebrews six nineteen through 20, we have this hope, which is the, the new relationship with God through Christ Jesus. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtains where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. The word picture here of, of this Hebrew writers is talking about this anchor for the soul. And that is where we have to be focused most on in our lives when life hurts. Life happens. We, at times, might get shipwrecked. We might at times feel like the ocean is crashing with waves over us. I, you know, that song we sometimes sing, Oceans, by Hillsong. If you've not paid attention to the words in that song, it, it builds, it has layers, and it builds an emotional intensity. And if you listen to the professional sing it, it really starts to build, and you feel the overwhelming weight. And I don't know if you've ever been to the ocean, but I've been to the ocean a couple of times and, and stood there with the breakers crashing on me. And, and, and the first time one hits you, you're like, wow, wow, that was pretty cool. Then bam, another one hits you, you're like, whoa, okay. You know, and, and then that ocean is relentless. It just keeps coming, right? The waves keep on coming. And yet, here the author writes that Jesus is an anchor for our soul. That while we feel like we're being washed over, we feel that we've been shipwrecked. We don't know what's going to happen to us. We have something that is holding steady. We have a bedrock, a firm foundation that is going to keep us from washing out of the picture. And that is the cross of Jesus. And that is what Jesus has done for us. It's not just something that He's done once for us. It's something that is an ongoing, ever steadfast thing. And that's the thing that we have to be holding on to most when life hurts. That's the place where we have to be. If we will just look at the cross when life hurts most, we will see four things. And you'll notice your sermon notes have nothing to do with what I'm preaching. But if you'd like to take notes, these are my four points coming up. When we look at the cross, life hurts, we have these four things. The first is simply that the cross tells us that God loves us. 
It's at the cross that we can understand that God loves us. That's what we need to know when the bottom falls out of life. God loves me. Because one of the thoughts that might run through our mind when trouble comes is, does God really love me? He must not love me because he's letting this happen to me, right? And the only way for us to get past that thought is to get eyeball to eyeball with the cross of Jesus. The cross is that place we know that God showed us, he loves us, before we ever made a move towards God. 1 John 4.10 says it this way, This is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when the bottom drops out, when we hit those potholes in life, we need to say to ourselves, get on your knees and get your eyes on the cross, because as soon as you do, you will know that God loves you. And this is not going to be a simple answer. Please understand that's not going to make sense of all of what's necessarily going on in our times of struggle, but it brings us assurance that in the middle of it all, there is something that we can be anchored to. That there is a God who loves us unconditionally, and He always has and He always will. And we know absolutely that it is true, not because of our circumstances. We know it's true because of the cross of Jesus Christ. The second thing that the cross tells us is that God allowed freedom, but he maintains control. We probably don't understand this completely, and I don't think we ever will on this side of the cross. But we see it at the cross. And here's an example. At the cross, there were men who crucified Jesus. Acts chapter 2 Uh, talks about all this and and some other stuff. And and we see as we read through the Gospel Testament in the New Testament that uh, that Jesus was, was betrayed and crucified at the hands of some angry men. And in this story, it tells us that that one of the authorities came out because it was during a religious holiday. And it was at this time, it was just standard practice. They were used to doing this. They would always release a criminal on this holiday. And so this man comes out and he says to the crowd, Hey, I'm going to release somebody like we do every year. Uh, We let some criminal go. You guys decide, who do you want? Do you want Barabbas, this notorious criminal? Or how about we set Jesus free? And of course, if you you know the story, they start, start yelling, you know, Free Barabbas, crucify Jesus, right? We want you to free Barabbas. We want Jesus crucified. It looks like a mob mentality. The the people are going crazy. They're yelling. They're screaming. And these guys have just come to work that day. Roman soldiers, right? And they're like, I'm just here punching the clock, doing whatever the boss tells me to do. I mean, the guys who crucified Jesus didn't have any skin in this game. They were just doing what they were told to do, right? Who's coming in today? Their their job, they, they were literally, their job was crucifying people. And it's like, well, they pulled out the clipboard, who's on the sheet today? And they did their job. The guy who put stakes through his hands, the the guys who raised him up, the guys who brought the beams in, I didn't care who they were crucifying that day. It was just men doing their job. It was freedom. It was choice. It looked like chaos. But when we see the cross in the middle of all of that, was God in charge or not? Did the men make choices? Yeah. They choose to show up to work that day and whatever else. You see, God allowed freedom. But He maintained control, and He's doing that right now. You see, God is in control of our lives. He's always in control of this world. But this world, is, it, it, it's crazy, and it's, it's broken down because of the freedom in this world. And all kinds of horrible stuff can happen, and all kinds of trouble can come into our lives. And, and we call that sin. And that is the effects of sin. And some might say, well, why didn't God stop that? Because He will and He can. But you see, the thing is, when God does stop that, life as we know it will end. God promises us He will stop all the craziness. But He also tells us, for now, there is trouble. But the good news is, we have an overcoming Jesus. 
The third thing that the cross tells us is that God can use the worst for eternal good. Now, if we were at the cross, if we were there on Good Friday, what would we have thought? We might think that God wasn't powerful or even real necessarily, because there, there's Jesus. Or we might think that all the stuff that he's promised is just a fairy tale. There's Jesus. Standing there, we might have thought the worst things possible that could have ever happened on the planet had happened. That the Son of God had been, had been beaten, stripped, and then beaten again, and then crucified, and, and was dead. But the thing is, we're not standing there that day at the foot of the cross. We are here today with all of the years of history behind us. And, and from our vantage point... From our vantage point, we now see the cross of Jesus as perhaps the most beautiful thing ever. And that's because God can take the worst things and turn it into something for eternal good. And we have to know that when the bottom falls out of life. The fourth thing that we see when we look at the cross is that God... God paints on a bigger canvas than we can see or even understand. If we saw the cross simply as a snapshot, we might think, man, God, is, God has lost control. Uh, he, 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 he isn't loving or powerful even. But now we see it as just a little part of a huge mosaic of the story of God. And it's this really bright, shining tile in that mosaic. It's because God is always painting on that canvas that's bigger than we can see or understand. But at the end of the day, there is hope. There is an anchor for our soul in the cross of Christ. And God has never lost control. God will take the worst and use it for His eternal good. God is painting on a canvas bigger than we can see or even understand. And the cross is saying to us every day that God understands our pain and He cares. Consider this from Mark 4. Many of the disciples were, were seasoned fishermen. They lived in boats. They, they knew the weather. They, they understood storms and how to survive. Yet in Mark 4, there's a storm that comes and fear comes over them so much so that they came to think that Jesus who was with them in the boat that day didn't care about them. Mark 4, 35-40 says this, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Jesus, let's cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was beginning to fill with water. And, and he was up in the stern, it says in Scripture, and he was laying there. He was asleep on a pillow. And, and, and the disciples, they go to him, they say, Jesus, they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to die? And Jesus wakes up, and he, and he looks around, and and he literally rebukes the wind with words. He looks at the sea. Peace. Be calm. Be still. And the winds ceased. And the waves calmed. And then he said to his disciples, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? It is these very same disciples who were fearful disciples in this moment who later became bold disciples to a man willing to give their life for Christ as they spread the gospel to others. When bad stuff happens, we might want to run away from God. We, want, we might want to be mad at God. We might even want to hate God. But when we look at the cross, we know we can't do that because we realize we can't stop simply with the question of, God, why is this happening to me? We cannot stop there. If we will just, again, look at the cross, another thought will emerge, and it's this. Not just, what, why is this happening to me? But it's the realization that what is happening to me has happened to you first. You see, God knows about pain. 
He went through loss. God knows about death. God knows about being mistreated and being rejected. God knows. And He can relate to each and every one of us in our pain. I'm not going to run away from the cross. I'm going to run to the cross. As Christians, we need to say, Lord, I'm not going to run away from you. I'm going to run to you. Because you are the only person who truly knows what I am feeling right now and what I've gone through. Sure, God can change our circumstances. And we pray that he would, but many times he doesn't. But the cross is proof that even when God doesn't change the circumstances, he loves us anyhow. The cross is proof that God always has a purpose in every circumstance. And that God promises he will never let us go, no matter what comes our way. He will hold us. His truth and his cross will be an anchor for us, no matter what. And his word may not be for you today, but it's for you at some point. Because at some point in time, you're going to hit a pothole with a cement truck coming. Someday the bottom is going to fall out of life. Someday trouble is going to happen. Someday you're going to go to the doctor or get a phone call or something will come. The hope in trouble, folks, is in the cross of Jesus. If you have never put your hope and trust in Jesus, I would encourage you, I would invite you to do so today, right now, here at Glory Baptist Church. Not because I get some gold star in heaven because of it, because I don't. But because we all need hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. And if you are hearing my voice, I want you to share that hope with me. If you've never taken the final step of faith, I'd invite you to do that right now. Right here. Today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now, if, if somebody is here today, Lord, and they just have struggled with hope, particularly with not knowing you and having the hope that that brings, the eternal hope, right now, God, I would pray that they would pray along with me. If you've never had Jesus in your heart and you would like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just pray along with me today. Jesus, I, I acknowledge that you are God and I am not. And I am just tired, Lord, of being my own God. Please forgive me. Lord, I have been disobedient and I am sorry for my sins. And I do believe that Jesus died for me and paid the debt for my evil deeds and that he is the bringer of hope for eternal life. So God, come now into my heart. Live inside of me. Be my, be my personal Lord and Savior. God, I turn away from my sinful ways and I choose your will for my life. God, I believe with my heart and I, I'm willing to confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, are now my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for me to bring me hope and that when you were raised again, my hope was raised with you. I commit myself to following you every day for the rest of my life. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and with your power. It's in Jesus' name it is done. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.